Preface of the Song Celestial or Bhagavad Gita. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jyoti Tarvanath. The Song Celestial or Bhagavad Gita. Translated by Sir Edwin Arnold. To India. So have I read this wonderful and spirit thrilling speech by Krishna and Prince Arjun, held discoursing each with each. So have I writ its wisdom here, its hidden mystery. For England, O oh, our India, as dear to me as she. Edwin Arnold. Preface This famous and marvelous Sanskrit poem occurs as an episode of the Mahabharata in the sixth or Bhishma Parva of the great Hindu epic. It enjoys immense popularity and authority in India, where it is reckoned as one of the five jewels, Pancharatni, of the Vinagri literature. In plain but noble language, it unfolds a philosophical system which remains to this day the prevailing Brahmanic belief, blending as it does the doctrines of Kapila Patanjali and the Vedas. So lofty are many of its declarations, so sublime its aspirations, so pure and tender its piety, that Schlegel, after his study of the poem, breaks forth into this outburst of delight and praise towards its unknown author. Magistrorum reverentia brachimanisi inter sancatissima, pietatis aficere fertur ergote primum, vatisi sancatissime numinis co faifeta, quisquistandam inter mortales, dictus tu fioris carminis buius octoro, cuius oraculis mens ad excelsa queque quaque, aeterna quo divina, Cuminerawa, cudum delectonte rapitere primum in quam, salvere ubeo e vestigia thosam peradore. Lawson re echoes this splendid tribute, and indeed, so striking are some of the moralities here inculcated, and so does the parallelism, oft times actually verbal, between its teaching and those of the New Testament that a controversy has arisen between pundits and missionaries on the point whether the author borrowed from Christian sources or the evangelists and apostles from him. This raises the question of its date, which cannot be positively settled. It must have been inlaid into the ancient epic at a period later than that of the original Mahabharata. But Mr. Kashinath Telang has offered some fair arguments to prove it anterior to the Christian era. The weight of evidence, however, tends to place its composition at about the third century after Christ, and perhaps there are really echoes in this Brahminic poem of the lessons of Galilee and of the Syrian incarnation. Its scene is the level country between the Yamuna and the Saraswati rivers, now Kurnool and Jind. Its simple plot consists of a dialogue held by Prince Arjuna, the brother of King Yudhishthira, with Krishna, the supreme deity, wearing the disguise of the charioteer. A great battle is impending between the armies of Kauravas and Pandavas, and this conversation is maintained in a war chariot drawn up between the opposing hosts. The poem has been turned into French by Bonoff, into Latin by Lassen, into Italian by Stanislaw Gatti, into Greek by Galanos, and into English by Mr. Thompson and Mr. Davis, the prose transcript of the last named being truly beyond praise for its fidelity and clearness. Mr. Talang has also published at Bombay a version of its colloquial rhythm, eminently learned and intelligent, but not conveying the dignity or grace of the original. 
if i venture to offer a translation of the wonderful poem after so many superior scholars it is in grateful recognition of the help derived from their labors and because english literature would certainly be incomplete without possessing in popular form a poetical and philosophical work so dear to india there is little else to say which the song celestial does not explain for itself the sanskrit original is written in the anasthub meter which cannot be successfully reproduced for western ears i have therefore cast it into our flexible blank verse changing into lyrical measures where the text itself similarly breaks for the most part i believe the sense to be faithfully preserved in the following pages but schlegel himself had to say ire conditiare bus me sam per poiuta fosta mentim recte divinasse firmare nau nausima those who would read more upon the philosophy of the poem may find an admirable introduction in the volume of mr davis printed by messrs turbner and co edwin arnold c s i end of preface Recording by Jyoti Tharavanat Chapter 1 of The Song Celestial or Bhagavad Gita translated by Sir Edwin Arnold This LibriVox recording is in the public domain Recording by Jyoti Tharavanat Dhritarashtra said Ranged thus for battle on the sacred plain on Kurukshetra Say, Sanjaya, say, what wrought my people and the Pandavas? Sanjaya said, When he beheld the host of Pandavas, Raja Duryodhana to Drona drew, and spake these words, Ah, Guru, see this line, how vast it is of Pandu fighting men, embattled by the son of Drupada, thy scholar in the war, therein stand ranked chiefs like Arjuna, like to be my chiefs benders of bows viratha yayudhan drupada eminent upon his car drishta kaith chekithan kasi stout lord purujit kuntiboj and saivavya with yudhamanyu and utmauj subhadra child and draupadis all famed all mounted on their shining chariots on our side too thou west of brahmans see excellent chiefs commanders of my line whose names i joy to count thyself the first then bhishma karna kripa fierce in fight vikarana aswatthaman next to these strong saumadatti with full many more valiant and tried ready this day to die for me their king each with his weapon grasped each skilful in the field weakest to me seems our battle shows where bhishma holds command and bhima fronting him something too strong have care our captains nigh to bhishma's ranks prepare what help they may now blow my shell then at the signal of the aged king with blare to wake the blood rolling around like to a lion's roar the trumpeter blew the great conch and at the noise of it trumpets and drums cymbals and gongs and horns burst into sudden clamor as the blasts of loosened tempest such the tumult seemed then might be seen upon their car of gold yoked with white steeds blowing their battle shells krishna the god arjuna at his side krishna with knotted locks blew his great conch carved of the giant's bone Arjuna blew Indira's loud gift Bhima the terrible wolf-bellied Bhima blew a long reed conch and Yudhishthira Kunti's blameless son winded a mighty shell victory's voice and Nakula blew shrill upon his conch named the sweet sounding Sahadev on his called gem bedecked and Kasi's prince on his Sikandhi on his car Drishtadyum, Viratha, Satyaki, the unsubdued, Drupada with his sons, O Lord of Earth, long-armed Subhadra's children, 
all blew loud, so that the clangor shook their four men's hearts with quaking earth and thundering heaven. Then it was, beholding Dhridharashtra's battle set, weapons unsheathing, bows drawn forth, the war instant to break Arjun, whose ensign badge was Hanuman the monkey, spake this thing to Krishna the divine's charioteer drive dauntless one to yonder open ground betwixt the armies i would see more nigh these who will fight with us those we must slay to-day in war's arbitrament for sure on bloodshed all are bent who throng this plain obeying dhridrashtra's sinful son thus by arjuna prayed o bharata between the hosts that heavenly charioteer drove the bright car reining its milk-white steeds where bhishma led and drona and their lords see spake he to arjuna where they stand thy kindred of the kurus and the prince marked on each hand the kinsmen of his house grandsires and sires uncles and brothers and sons cousins and sons-in-law and nephews mixed with friends and honoured elders some this side some that side ranged and seeing those opposed such kith grown enemies arjuna's heart melted with pity while he uttered this arjuna said krishna as i behold come here to shed their common blood yon concourse of our kin my members fail my tongue dries in my mouth a shudder thrills my body and my hair bristles with horror from my weak hand slips gandiv the goodly bow a fever burns my skin to parching hardly may i stand the life within me seems to swim and faint nothing do i foresee save woe and wail it is not good o keshav naught of good can spring from mutual slaughter lo i hate triumph and domination wealth and ease thus sadly won ah ho what victory can bring delight govinda what rich spoils could profit what rule recompense what span of life itself seem sweet bought with such blood seeing that these stand here ready to die for whose sake life was fair and pleasure pleased and power grew precious grandsires sires and sons brothers and fathers-in-law and sons-in-law elders and friends shall i deal death on these even though they seek to slay us not one blow o mother Sudan, will i strike to gain the rule of all three worlds then how much less to seize an earthly kingdom killing these must breed but anguish krishna if they be guilty we shall grow guilty by their deaths their sins will light on us if we shall slay those sons of dhridrashtra and our kin what peace could come of that o madhava for if indeed blinded by lust and wrath these cannot see or will not see the sin of kingly lines overthrown and kinsmen slain how shall not we who see shun such a crime we who perceive the guilt and feel the shame o thou delight of men janardana by overthrow of houses perisheth their sweet continuous household piety and rights neglected piety extinct enters impiety upon that home its women grow unwomened whence there spring mad passions and the mingling up of castes sending a hellward road that family and whose wrought its doom by wicked wrath nay and the souls of honoured ancestors fall from the place of peace being bereft of funeral cakes 
and the worn death water so teach our holy hymns thus if we slay kinsfolk and friends for love of earthly power ahoweth what an evil fault it were better i deem it if my kinsmen strike to face them weaponless and bare my breast to shaft and spear than answer blow with blow so speaking in the face of those two hosts arjuna sank upon his chariot seat and let fall bow and arrows sick at heart here endeth chapter one of the bhagavad-gita entitled arjun vishad or the book of the distress of arjuna end of chapter one recording by jyoti taravanat chapter two of the song celestial or bhagavad gita translated by sir edwin arnold this librivox recording is in the public domain Recording by Jyoti Taravanat, Sanjaya said, "Him filled with such compassion and such grief, with eyes tear dimmed, despondent, in stern words the driver Madhusudan thus addressed." Krishna said, "How hath this weakness taken thee? When springs the inglorious trouble, shameful to the brave." barring the path of virtue nay arjun forbid thyself to feebleness it mars thy warrior name cast off the coward fit wake be thyself arise scourge of thy foes arjuna said how can i in the battle shoot with shafts on bhishma or on drona o thou chief both worshipful both honorable men better to live on beggar's bread with those we love alive than taste their blood in rich feast spread and guiltily survive ah were it worse who knows to be victor or vanquished here when those confront us angrily whose death leaves living drear in pity lost by doubting stost my thoughts distracted turn to thee the guide i reverence most that i may counsel learn i know not what would heal the grief burned into soul and sense if i were earth's unchallenged chief a god and these gone thence sanjaya said so spake arjuna to the lord of hearts and sighing i will not fight held silence then to whom with tender smile o bharata while the prince wept despairing twixt those hosts krishna made answer in divinest verse krishna said thou grievest where no grief should be thou speakest words lacking wisdom for the wise in heart mourn not for those that live nor those that die nor i nor thou nor any one of these ever was not nor ever will not be for ever and for ever afterwards all that doth live lives always to man's frame as there comes infancy and youth and age so come there raisings up and layings down of other and of other life abodes which the wise know and fear not this that irks thy sense life thrilling to the elements bringing thee heat and cold sorrows and joys it's brief and mutable bear with it prince as the wise bear the soul which is not moved the soul that with a strong and constant calm takes sorrow and takes joy indifferently lives in the life undying that which is can never cease to be that which is not will not exist 
to see this truth of both is theirs who part is sense from accident substance from shadow indestructible learn thou the life is spreading life through all it cannot anywhere by any means be any wise diminished stayed or changed but for these fleeting frames which it informs with spirit deathless endless infinite they perish let them perish prince and fight he who shall say lo i have slain a man he who shall think lo i am slain those both know not life cannot slay life is not slain never the spirit was born the spirit shall cease to be never never was time it was not end and beginning are dreams birthless and deathless and changeless remaineth the spirit for ever death hath not touched it at all dead though the house of it seems who knoweth it exhaustless self-sustained immortal indestructible shall such say i have killed a man or cause to kill nay but as when one layeth his worn-out robes away and taking new ones saith these will i wear to-day so putteth by the spirit lightly its garb of flesh and passeth to inherit a residence afresh i say to thee weapons reach not the life flame burns it not waters cannot overwhelm nor dry winds wither it impenetrable unentered unassailed unharmed untouched immortal all arriving stable sure invisible ineffable by word and thought uncompassed ever all itself thus is the soul declared how wilt thou then knowing it so grieve when thou shouldst not grieve how if thou hearest that the man new dead is like the man new born still living man one same existent spirit wilt thou weep the end of birth is death the end of death is birth this is ordained and mournest thou chief of the stalwart arm for what befalls which could not otherwise befall the birth of living things comes unperceived the death comes unperceived between them beings perceive what is there sorrowful here in dear prince wonderful wistful to contemplate difficult doubtful to speak upon strange and great for tongue to relate mystical hearing for every one nor wotteth man this what a marvel it is when seeing and saying and hearing are done this life within all living things my prince hides beyond harm scorn thou to suffer then for that which cannot suffer do thy part be mindful of thy name and tremble not not better can betide a martial soul than lawful war happy the warrior to whom comes joy of battle comes as now glorious and fair unsought opening for him a gateway unto heaven but if thou shunnest this honourable field a kshatriya if knowing thy duty and thy task thou biddest duty and task go by then shall be sin and those to come shall speak thee infamy from age to age but infamy is worse for men of noble blood to bear than death the chiefs upon their battle chariots will deem to fear that drove thee from the fray of those who held thee mighty souled the scorn thou must abide while all thine enemies will scatter bitter speech of thee to mock the valour which thou hadst what fate could fall more grievously than this either being killed thou wilt win swarga's safety or 
alive and victor thou wilt reign an earthly king therefore arise thou son of kunti brace thine arm for conflict nerve thy heart to meet as things alike to thee pleasure or pain profit or ruin victory or defeat so minded gird thee to the fight for so thou shalt not sin thus far i speak to thee as from the sankhya unspiritually hear now the deeper teaching of the yog which holding understanding thou shalt burst thy karma bala the bondage of wrought deeds here shall no end be hindered no hope marred no loss be feared faith here yeah, a little faith shall save thee from the anguish of thy dread here glory of the kurus shines one rule one steadfast rule while shifting souls have laws many and hard specious but wrongful deem the speech of those ill-taught ones who extolled the letter of the vedas saying this is all we have or need being weak at heart with wands seekers of heaven which comes they say as fruits of good deeds done promising men much profit in new births for works of faith in various rites abounding following whereon large merit shall accrue toward wealth and power albeit who wealth and power do most desire least fixity of soul have such least hold on heavenly meditation much these teach from vedas concerning the three qualities but thou be free of the three qualities free of the pairs of opposites and free from that sad righteousness which calculates self-ruled arjuna simple satisfied look like as when a tank pours water forth to suit all needs so do these brahmans draw texts from all wands from tank of holy writ but thou want not ask not find full reward of doing right in right let right deeds be thy motive not the fruit which comes from them and live in action labor make thine acts thy piety casting all self aside contemning gain and merit equable in good or evil equability is yog is piety yet the right act is less far less than the right thinking mind seek refuge in thy soul have there thy heaven scorn them that follow virtue for her gifts the mind of pure devotion even here casts equally aside good deeds and bad passing above them unto pure devotion devote thyself with perfect meditation comes perfect act and the right-hearted rise more certainly because they seek no gain forth from their bands of body step by step to highest seats of bliss when thy firm soul hath shaken off those tangled oracles which ignorantly guide then shall it soar to high neglect of what's denied or said this way or that way in doctrinal writ troubled no longer by the priestly law safe shall it live and sure steadfastly bent on meditation this is yog and peace arjuna said what is his mark who hath that steadfast heart confirmed in holy meditation how know we his speech keshava sits he moves he like other men krishna said when one o partha son abandoning desires which shake the mind finds in his soul full comfort for his soul he hath attained the yog that man as such in sorrows not dejected and in joys not overjoyed dwelling outside the stress of passion fear and anger fixed in calms of lofty contemplation such a one is muni is a sage 
the true recluse he who to none and nowhere overbound by ties of flesh takes evil things and good neither desponding nor exulting such bears wisdom's plainest mark he who shall draw as a wise tortoise draws its four feet safe under its shield his five frail senses back under the spirit's buckler from the world which else assails them such a one my prince hath wisdom's mark things that solicit sense hold off from the self-governed nay it comes the appetites of him who lives beyond depart aroused no more yet may it chance o son of kunti that a governed mind shall sometime feel the sense storms sweep and rest strong self-control by the roots let him regain his kingdom let him conquer this and sit on me intent that man alone is wise who keeps the mastery of himself if one ponders on objects of the sense there springs attraction from attraction grows desire desire flames to fierce passion passion breeds recklessness then the memory all betrayed lets noble purpose go and saps the mind till purpose mind and man are all undone but if one deals with objects of the sense not loving and not hating making them serve his free soul which rests serenely lord lo such a man comes to tranquillity and out of that tranquillity shall rise the end and healing of his earthly pains since the will governed sets the soul at peace the soul of the ungoverned is not his nor hath he knowledge of himself which lacked how gross serenity and wanting that when shall he hope for happiness the mind that gives itself to follow shows of sense seeth its helm of wisdom rent away and like a ship in waves of whirlwind drives to wreck and death only with him great prince whose senses are not swayed by things of sense only with him who holds his mastery shows wisdom perfect what is midnight gloom to unenlightened souls shines wakeful day to his clear gaze what seems as wakeful day is known for night thick night of ignorance to his true seeing eyes such is the saint and like the ocean day by day receiving floods from all lands which never overflows its boundary line not leaping and not leaving fed by the rivers but unswelled by those so is the perfect one to his soul's ocean the world of sense pours streams of witchery they leave him as they find without commotion taking their tribute but remaining sea yeah whoso shaking off the yoke of flesh lives lord not servant of his lusts set free from pride from passion from the sin of self toucheth tranquillity o partha son that is the state of brahm there rests no dread when the last step is reached live where he will die when he may such passeth from all planing to blessed nirvana with the gods attaining here endeth chapter two of the bhagavad-gita entitled sankhya yoga or the book of doctrines end of chapter two recording by jyoti taravanat chapter three of the song celestial or bhagavad gita translated by sir edwin arnold this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by jyoti taravanat arjuna said thou whom all mortals praise janardana if meditation be a nobler thing than action wherefore then great keshava dost thou impel me to this dreadful fight 
Now am I by thy doubtful speech disturbed? Tell me one thing, and tell me certainly, By what road shall I find the better end? Krishna said, I told thee, blameless Lord, There be two paths shown to this world, Two schools of wisdom. First, the Sankhyas, Which doth save in way of works prescribed by reason. Next, the yog, which bids attain by meditation, spiritually. Yet these are one. No man shall escape from act by shunning action. Nay, and none shall come by mere announcements unto perfectness. Nay, and no jot of time, at any time, rests any actionless. His nature's law compels him, even unwilling, into act. For thought is act in fancy. He who sits oppressing all the instruments of flesh, et in his idle art thinking on them, plays the inept and guilty hypocrite. But he who, with strong body serving mind, gives up his mortal powers to worthy work, not seeking gain, Arjuna, such a one is honourable. Do thine allotted task. Work is more excellent than idleness. The body's life proceeds not, lacking work. There is a task of holiness to do, unlike world-binding toil, which bindeth not the faithful soul, such earthly duty do free from desire, and thou shalt well perform thy heavenly purpose. Spake Prajapati, in the beginning when all men were made, and with mankind the sacrifice, do this, work, sacrifice, Increase and multiply with sacrifice. This shall be Kamaduk, your cow of plenty, giving back her milk of all abundance. Worship the gods thereby. The gods shall yield thee grace. Those meats ye crave, the gods will grant to labour when it pays tithes in the altar flame. But if one eats fruits of the earth, rendering to kindly heaven no gift of toil, that thief steals from his world. Who eat of food after their sacrifice are quit of fault. But they that spread a feast all for themselves eat sin and drink of sin. By food the living live, food comes of rain, and rain comes by the pious sacrifice, and sacrifice is paid with tithes of toil. Thus action is of Brahma, who is one, the only, all-pervading, at all times present in sacrifice. He that abstains to help the rolling wheels of this great world, glutting his idle sense, lives a lost life, shameful and vain, existing for himself, self-concentrated, serving self alone. No part hath he in aught, nothing achieved, not wrought or unwrought toucheth him, no hope of help, for all the living things of earth depends from him. Therefore, thy task prescribed, with spirit unattached, gladly perform. Since in performance of plain duty, man mounts to his highest bliss. By works alone, Janak and ancient saints reached blessedness. Moreover, for the upholding of thy kind action thou shouldst embrace. What the wise chose, the unwise people take. What best men do, the multitude will follow. Look on me, thou son of Pritha. In the three wide worlds I am not bound to any toil. No height awaits to scale. No gift remains to gain. Yet I act here. And if I acted not earnest and watchful, those that look to me for guidance, sinking back to sloth again because I slumbered, would decline from good and I should break earth's order and commit her offspring unto ruin. Bharata, even as the unknowing toil, wedded to sense, so let the enlightened toil, sense freed, but set to bring the world deliverance, and its bliss, not sowing in those simple, busy heart seed of despair. Yea, let each play his part in all he finds to do, with unyoked soul all things are everywhere by nature wrought in interaction of the qualities. The fool cheated 
by self thinks this i did and that i wrought but ah thou strong armed prince a better lessoned mind knowing the play of visible things within the world of sense and how the qualities must qualify standeth aloof even from his acts the untaught live mixed with them knowing not nature's way of highest aims unwitting slow and dull those make thou not to stumble having the light but all thy dues discharging for my sake with meditation centred inwardly seeking no profit satisfied serene heedless of issue fight they who shall keep my ordinance thus the wise and willing hearts have quittance from all issue of their acts but those who disregard my ordinance thinking they know know not and fall to laws confused and foolish sooth the instructed one doth of his kind following what fits him most and lower creatures of their kind in vain contending against the law needs must it be the objects of the sense will stir the sense to like and dislike yet the enlightened man yields not to these knowing them enemies finally this is better that one do his own task as he may even though he fail than take tasks not his own though they seem good to die performing duty is no ill but who seeks other roads shall wander still arjuna said yet tell me teacher by what force doth man go to his ill unwilling as if one pushed him that evil path krishna said karma it is passion it is born of the darknesses which pusheth him mighty of appetite sinful and strong is this man's enemy as smoke blots the white fire as clinging rust mars the bright mirror as the womb surrounds the babe unborn so is the world of things foiled soiled enclosed in this desire of flesh the wise fall caught in it the unresting foe it is of wisdom wearing countless forms fair but deceitful subtle as a flame sense mind and reason these o kunti's son are booty for it in its play with these it maddens man beguiling blinding him therefore thou noblest child of bharata govern thy heart constrain the entangled sense resist the false soft sinfulness which saps knowledge and judgment ya yeah, the world is strong but what discerns it stronger and the mind strongest and high over all the ruling soul wherefore perceiving him who reigns supreme put forth full force of soul in thy own soul fight vanquish foes and doubts dear hero slay what haunts thee in fond shapes and would betray here endeth chapter 3 of the bhagavad gita entitled karma yog or the book of virtue in work end of chapter 3 recording by jyoti taravanat chapter 4 of the song celestial or bhagavad gita translated by sir edwin arnold this librivox recording is in the public domain krishna said this deathless yoga this deep union i taught vivashvatha the lord of light vivashvatha to manu gave it he to ikshavaku so passed it down the line of all my royal rishis then with the years the truth grew dim and perished noble prince now once again to thee it is declared this ancient lore this mystery supreme seeing i find thee votary and friend arjuna said thy birth dear lord was in these later days 
and bright Vivaswathas preceded time. How shall I comprehend this thing thou sayest? From the beginning it was I who taught. Krishna said, Manifold the renewals of my birth have been, Arjuna, and of thy birth still. But mine I know, and thine thou knowest not. O slayer of thy foes, albeit I be unborn, undying, indestructible, the lord of all things living, not the less, by Maya, by my magic which I stamp on floating nature forms, the primal vast, I come and go and come. When righteousness declines, O Bharata, when wickedness is strong, I rise from age to age and take visible shape and move a man with men, succoring the good, thrusting the evil back and setting virtue on her seat again. Who knows the truth touching my births on earth and my divine work? When he quits the flesh, puts on its load no more, falls no more down to earthly birth, to me he comes, dear prince. Many there be who come, from fear set free, from anger, from desire, keeping their hearts fixed upon me, my faithful, purified by sacred flame of knowledge, such as these mix with my being. Whoso worship me, them I exalt. But all men everywhere shall fall into my path, albeit those souls which seek reward for works make sacrifice now to the lower gods. I say to thee, here have they their reward, but I am he made the four castes, and portion them a place after their qualities and gifts. Yea, I created the reposeful, I that live immortally, made all those mortal births, for work soil not my essence, being works wrought uninvolved. Who knows me acting thus unchained by action? Action binds not him. And so perceiving, all those saints of old worked, seeking for deliverance, work thou as, in the days gone by, thy fathers did. Thou sayest, perplexed, it hath been asked before by singers and by sages, What is act, and what inaction? I will teach thee this. And, knowing, thou shalt learn which work doth save, needs must one rightly meditate those three, doing, not doing, and undoing. Here thorny and dark the path is. He who sees how action may be rest, rest action, he is wisest amid his kind. He hath the truth. He doeth well, acting or resting, freed in all his works from prickings of desire, burned clean in act by the white fire of truth. The wise call that man wise, and such a one, renouncing fruit of deeds, always content, always self-satisfying. If he works, doth nothing that shall stain his separate soul, which, quit of fear and hope, subduing self-rejecting outward impulse, yielding up to bodies need nothing save body, dwells sinless amid all sin, with equal calm taking what may befall by grief unmoved, unmoved by joy, unenvyingly the same in good and evil fortunes, no wise bound by bond of deeds, nay, but of such a one whose crave is gone, whose soul is liberate, whose heart is set on truth. Of such a one, what work he does is work of sacrifice which passeth purely into ash and smoke consumed upon the altar, all's then God. The sacrifice is Brahm, the ghee and grain are Brahm, the fire is Brahm, the flesh it eats is Brahm, and unto Brahm attains he who in such office meditates on Brahm. Some votaries there be who serve the gods with flesh and altar smoke, but other some who, 
Lighting subtler fires make purer right with will of worship, of the which be they who, in white flame of continence, consume joys of the sense, delights of eye and ear, forgoing tender speech and sound of song, and they who, kindling fires with torch of truth, burn on a hidden altar stone the bliss of youth and love, renouncing happiness, and they who lay for offering there their wealth their penance, meditation, piety, their steadfast reading of the scrolls, their low painfully gained with long austerities, and they who, making silent sacrifice, draw in their breath to feed the flame of thought, and breathe it forth to waft the heart on high, governing the vantage of each entering air, lest one sigh pass which helpeth not the soul, and they who, day by day denying needs lay life itself upon the altar flame burning the body worn lo all these keep the rite of offering as if they slew victims and all thereby efface such sin yea and who feed on the immortal food left of such sacrifice to brahma pass to the unending but for him that makes no sacrifice he hath nor part nor lot even in the present world. How should he share another? O thou glory of thy line! In sight of Brahma, all these offerings are spread and are accepted. Comprehend that all proceed by act. For knowing this, thou shalt be quit of doubt. The sacrifice which knowledge pays is better than gifts offered by wealth since gifts worth o my prince lies in the mind which gives the will that serves and these are gained by reverence by strong search by humble heed of those who see the truth and teach it knowing truth thy heart no more will ache with error for the truth shall show all things subdued to thee as thou to me moreover son of pandu wert thou worst of all wrongdoers this fair ship of truth should bear thee safe and dry across the sea of thy transgressions as the kindled flame feeds on the fuel till it sinks to ash so unto ash arjuna unto naught the flame of knowledge wastes works draws away there is no purifier like thereto in all this world and he who seeketh it shall find it, being grown perfect in himself. Believing, he receives it when the soul masters itself, and cleaves to truth, and comes, possessing knowledge, to the higher peace, the uttermost repose. But those untaught, and those without full faith, and those who fear are shent, no peace is here or otherwhere no hope no happiness for whoso doubts he that being self-contained hath vanquished doubt disparting self from service soul from works enlightened and emancipate my prince works fetter him no more cut then a twain with sword of wisdom son of bharata this doubt that binds thy heart beats Cleave the bond born of thy ignorance. Be bold and wise. Give thyself to the field with me. Arise. Here endeth chapter 4 of the Bhagavad Gita, entitled Jnana Yoga, or The Book of Religion of Knowledge. End of chapter 4 Recording by Jyoti Taravanat Chapter 5 of the Song Celestial or Bhagavad Gita Translated by Sir Edwin Arnold This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jyoti Taravanat Arjuna said, Yet Krishna at the one time thou dost lord surcease of works, and at another time service through work. 
of these twain plainly tell which is the better way krishna said to cease from works is well and to do works in holiness is well and both conduct to bliss supreme but of these twain the better way is his who working piously refraineth not that is the true renouncer firm and fixed who seeking not rejecting not dwells proof against the opposites o valiant prince in doing such breaks lightly from all deed it's the new scholar talks as they were two the sankhya and the yoga wise men know who husbands one plucks golden fruit of both the region of high rest which sankhyas reach yogins attain who sees this twain as one sees with clear eyes yet such abstraction chief is hard to win without much holiness whoso is fixed in holiness self-ruled pure-hearted lord of senses and of self lost in the common life of all which lives ya yoga yukt he is a saint who wends straight away to brahm such a one is not touched by taint of deeds not of myself i do thus will he think who holds the truth of truths in seeing hearing touching smelling when he heats or goes or breathes slumbers or talks holds fast or loosens opens his eyes or shuts always assured this is the sense world plays with senses he that acts in thought of brahm detaching end from act with act content the world of sense can no more stain his soul than waters marath enameled lotus leaf with life with heart with mind nay with the help of all five senses letting selfhood go yogins toil ever towards their souls release such votaries renouncing fruit of deeds gain endless peace the unvowed the passion bound seeking a fruit from works or fastened down the embodied sage withdrawn within his soul at every act sits godlike in the town which hath nine gateways neither doing aught nor causing any deed this world's lord makes neither the work nor passion for work nor lust for fruit of work the man's own self pushes to these the master of this world takes on himself the good or evil deeds of no man dwelling beyond mankind errs here by folly darkening knowledge but for whom that darkness of the soul is chased by light splendid and clear shines manifest the truth as if a sun of wisdom sprang to shed its beams of dawn him meditating still him seeking with him blended stayed on him the souls illuminated take that road which hath no turning back their sins flung off by strength of faith who will may have this light who hath it sees to him who wisely sees the brahman with his scrolls and sanctities the cow the elephant the unclean dog the outcast gorging dog's meat or all one the world is overcome a eh, even here by such as fix their faith on unity the sinless brahma dwells in unity and they in brahma be not over glad attaining joy and be not over sad encountering grief but stayed on brahma still constant let each abide the sage whose soul holds off from outer contacts in himself finds bliss to brahma joined by piety his spirit tastes eternal peace the joys springing from sense life are but quickening wombs which breed sure griefs those joys begin and end 
the wise mind takes no pleasure kunti's son in such as those but if a man shall learn even while he lives and bears his body's chain to master lust and anger he is blessed he is the yukta he hath happiness contentment light within his life is merged in brahma's life he doth nirvana touch thus go the rishis unto rest who dwell with sins effaced with doubts at end with hearts governed and calm glad in all good they live nigh to the peace of god and all those live who pass their days exempt from greed and wrath subduing self and senses knowing the soul the saint who shuts outside his placid soul all touch of sense letting no contact through whose quiet eyes gaze straight from fixed brows whose outward breath and inward breath are drawn equal and slow through the nostrils still and close that one with organs heart and mind constrained bent on deliverance having put away passion and fear and rage hath even now obtained deliverance ever and ever freed yeah for he knows me who am he that heeds the sacrifice and worship god revealed and he who heeds not being lord of worlds lover of all that lives god unrevealed wherein who will shall find surety and shield here ends chapter 5 of the bhagavad gita entitled karma sanyasa yoga or the book of religion by renouncing fruit of works end of chapter 5 Recording by Jyoti Tharawanath. Chapter Six of the Song Celestial or Bhagavad Gita, translated by Sir Edwin Arnold. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jyoti Tharawanath. Chapter Six. Krishna said, "Therefore." who doeth work rightful to do not seeking gain from work that man o prince is sanyasi and yogi both in one and he is neither who lights not the flame of sacrifice nor setteth hand to task regard as true renouncer him that makes worship by work for who renounceth not works not as yogin so is that well said by works the votary doth rise to faith and saintship is a ceasing from all works because the perfect yogin acts but acts unmoved by passions and unbound by deeds setting result aside let each man raise the self by soul not trample down his self since soul that is self's friend may grow self's foe soul is self's friend when self doth rule over self but self turns enemy if soul's own self hates self as not itself the sovereign soul of him who lives self-governed and at peace is centered in itself taking alike pleasure and pain heat cold glory and shame he is the yogi he is yukta glad with joy of light and truth dwelling apart upon a peak with senses subjugate where to the clod the rock the glistening gold show all as one by this sign he is he known being of equal grace to comrades friends chance comers strangers lovers enemies aliens and kinsmen loving all alike evil or good sequestered should he sit steadfastly meditating solitary his thoughts controlled his passions laid away quit of belongings in a fair still spot having his fixed abode not too much raised nor yet too low let him abide his goods a cloth a deer skin and the kusa grass there setting hard his mind upon the one restraining heart and senses silent calm let him accomplish yoga and achieve pureness of soul holding immovable body and neck and head 
his gaze absorbed upon his nose end wrapped from all around tranquil in spirit free of fear intent upon his brahmacharya vow devout musing on me lost in the thought of me that yogin so devoted so controlled comes to the peace beyond my peace the peace of high nirvana but for earthly needs religion is not his who too much fasts or too much feasts nor his who sleeps away an idle mind nor his who wears to waste his strength in vigils nay arjuna call that the true piety which most removes earth aches and ills where one is moderate in eating and in resting and in sport measured in wish and act sleeping betimes waking betimes for duty when the man so living centers on his soul the thought straightly restrained untouched internally by stress of sense then is he yukta see steadfast a lamp burns sheltered from the wind such is the likeness of the yogi's mind shut from sense storms and burning bright to heaven when mind broods placid soothed with holy wont when self contemplates self and in itself hath comfort when it knows the nameless joy beyond all scope of sense revealed to soul only to soul and knowing way was not true to the farther truth when holding this it deems no other treasure comparable but harbored there cannot be stirred or shook by any gravest grief call that state peace that happy severance yoga call that man the perfect yogin steadfastly the will must toil thereto till efforts end in ease and thought has passed from thinking shaking off all longings bred by dreams of fame and gain shutting the doorways of the senses close with watchful ward so step by step it comes to gift of peace assured and heart assuaged when the mind dwells self wrapped and the soul broods cumberless but as often as the heart breaks wild and wavering from control so oft let him recurb it let him rein it back to the soul's governance for perfect bliss grows only in the bosom tranquilized the spirit passionless purged from offence vowed to the infinite he who thus vows his soul to the supreme soul quitting sin passes unhindered to the endless bliss of unity with brahma he so vowed so blended sees the life soul resident in all things living and all living things in that life soul contained and whoso thus discerneth me in all and all in me i never let him go nor loseth he hold upon me but dwell he where he may whatever his life in me he dwells and lives because he knows and worships me who dwell in all which lives and cleaves to me in all arjuna if a man sees everywhere taught by his own similitude one life one essence in the evil and the good hold him a yogi ya well perfected arjuna said slayer of madhu yet again this yog this peace derived from equanimity made known by thee i see no fixity therein no rest because the heart of men is unfixed krishna rash tumultuous wilful and strong it were all one i think to hold the wayward wind as tame man's heart krishna said hero long armed beyond denial hard man's heart is to restrain and wavering yet made grow to strain by habit prince by wont of self command this yog i say cometh not lightly to the ungoverned ones 
but he who will be master of himself shall win it if he stoutly strive thereto arjuna said and what road goeth he who having faith fails krishna in the striving falling back from holiness missing the perfect rule is he not lost straying from brahma's light like the vain cloud which floats twixt earth and heaven when lightning splits it and it vanisheth fain would i hear thee answer me herein since krishna none save thou can clear the doubt krishna said he is not lost thou son of pritha no nor earth nor heaven is forfeit even for him because no heart that holds one right desire treadeth the road of loss he who should fail desiring righteousness cometh at death unto the region of the just dwells there measureless years and being born anew beginneth life again in some fair home amid the mild and happy it may chance he doth descend into a yogin house on virtue's breast but that is rare such birth is hard to be obtained on this earth chief so hath he back again what heights of heart he did achieve and so he strives anew to perfectness with better hope dear prince for by the old desire he is drawn on unwittingly and only to desire the purity of yog is to pass beyond the sabadharm the spoken ved but being yogi striving strong and long purged from transgressions perfected by births following on births he plants his feet at last upon the farther path such as one ranks above ascetics higher than the wise beyond achievers of vast deeds be thou yogi arjuna and of such believe truest and best is he who worships me with inmost soul stayed on my mystery here endeth chapter 6 of the bhagavad gita entitled atma sanyama yog or the book of religion by self restraint end of chapter 6 recording by jyoti taravanat chapter 7 of the song celestial or bhagavad gita translated by sir edwin arnold this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by jyoti taravanat chapter 7 krishna said learn now dear prince how if thy soul be set ever on me still exercising yog still making me thy refuge thou shalt come most surely unto perfect hold of me i will declare to thee that at most low whole and particular which when thou knowest leaveth no more to know here in this world of many thousand mortals one perchance striveth for truth and of those few that strive nay and rise high one only here on there knoweth me as i am the very truth earth water flame air ether life and mind and individuality those eight make up the showing of me manifest these be my lower nature learn the higher whereby thou valiant one this universe is by its principle of life produced whereby the worlds of visible things are born as from a yoni no i am that womb i make and i unmake this universe than me there is no other master prince no other maker all these hang on me as hangs a row of pearls upon its string i am the fresh taste of the water i the silver of the moon the gold of the sun the word of worship in the vedas the thrill that passeth in the ether 
and the strength of man's shed seed i am the good sweet smell of the moistened earth i am the fire's red light the vital air moving in all which moves the holiness of hollowed souls the root undying whence hath sprung whatever is the wisdom of the wise the intellect of the informed the greatness of the great the splendor of the splendid kunti's son these am i free from passion and desire yet am i right desire in all who yearn chief of the bharatas for all those moods soothfast or passionate or ignorant which nature frames deduce from me but all are merged in me not i in them the world deceived by those three qualities of being wouteth not me who am outside them all above them all eternal hard it is to pierce that veil divine of various shows which hideth me yet they who worship me pierce it and pass beyond i am not known to evil doers nor to foolish ones nor to the base and churlish nor to those whose mind is cheated by the show of things nor those that take the way of the asuras four sorts of mortals know me he who weeps arjuna and the man who yearns to know and he who toils to help and he who sits certain of me enlightened of these four o prince of india highest nearest best that last is the devout soul wise intent upon the one dear above all am i to him and he is dearest unto me all four are good and seek me but mine own the true of heart the faithful stayed on me taking me as their utmost blessedness they are not mine but i even i myself at the end of many births to me they come yet hard the wise mahatma is to find that man who saith all is vasudev there be those too whose knowledge turned aside by this desire or that gives them to serve some lower gods with various rites constrained by that which mouldeth them and to all such worship what shrine they will what shapes in faith it's i who give them faith i am content the heart thus asking favor from its god darkened but ardent hath the end it craves the lesser blessing but it's i who give yet soon is withered what small fruit they reap those men of little minds who worship so go where they worship passing with their gods but mine come unto me blind are the eyes which deemeth the unmanifested manifest not comprehending me in my true self imperishable viewless and declared hidden behind my magic veil of shows i am not seen by all i am not known unborn and changeless to the idle world but i arjuna know all things which were and all which are and all which are to be albeit not one among them knoweth me by passion for the pairs of opposites by those twain snares of like and dislike prince all creatures live bewildered save some few who quit of sins holy in act informed freed from the opposites and fixed in faith cleave unto me who cleave who seek in me refuge from birth and death those have the truth those know me brahma know me soul of souls the adi atman no karma my work no i am adi bhuta lord of life and adi daiva lord of all the gods and adi yagna lord of sacrifice worship me well 
with hearts of love and faith, And find and hold me in the hour of death. Here endeth Chapter 7 of the Bhagavad Gita Entitled Vijnana Yog Or The Book of Religion by Discernment End of Chapter 7 Recording by Jyoti Taravanat Chapter 8 of The Song Celestial or Bhagavad Gita Translated by Sir Edwin Arnold This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jyoti Taravanat Chapter 8 Arjuna inquired, Who is that Brahma? What that soul of souls? The Adhyatman? What, thou best of all? Thy work, the Karma? Tell me what it is thou namest Adi Bhuta. What again means Adi Daiva? Ya, and how it comes thou canst be Adi Daiva in thy flesh? Slayer of Madhu. Further, make me know how good men find thee in the hour of death? Krishna said, I, Brahma, am the one eternal God, and Adiyatman is my being's name, the soul of souls. What goeth forth from me, Kasa?